136. If Jesus goes with me, let's stand together as we begin with this old hymn, all right? 136. It may be in the valley where countless dangers lie. It may be in the sunshine that I in peace abide. But this one thing I know, if it be dark or fair, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, wherever may be, he is there. I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. It may be I must carry the blessed word of life across the burning desert to those in sinful strife. And though it may be a lot to bear my colors there, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, wherever it may be, if he is there. I count it a privilege here, his grace to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. On the last, it is not mine to question the judgment of the Lord. It is but mine to follow the leading of his word. But if to go or stay, or whether here or there, I'll be with my Savior content anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, wherever it may be, if he is there. I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Amen. Please remain standing for prayer. Brother Ted, would you lead us, please? Thank you, my friend. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this midweek prayer service that we can gather into your house and be refreshed to here in the middle of the week after uh, working ready and Lord we we pray that you might refresh our souls and our our hearts and our minds uh, not only with the singing but with the fellowship of God's people and here in a few moments with the teaching and preaching of thy word pray you to be with our our pastor as he delivers to us another lesson from the book of Proverbs now Lord we love you and in Christ's name I pray amen amen you may be seated we're glad to have each one of you here with us tonight. We'll take a moment and recognize first-time visitors. Anyone here? First time you've ever been here? Right there on the back row. Where are you, where are you from, sir? Memphis. All right. What about you folks? Canada. That was a long drive today, wasn't it? Amen. Both of you? Both from Canada? Okay. What about you two? Okay. I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. All right. So glad to have you with us here. God bless you. All right. Anyone else? What's the matter on this side? There's no anybody? All right. Well, we're glad each one of you here with us tonight. Well, it's good to be back in God's house. Started out with a song we hadn't sung in forever in a day, and I almost couldn't sing it myself. Amen. So let's turn it over to 140, see if we can do any better on this one. All right. Wherever he leads, we've got a missions conference coming up this week. And so we're talking about going and winning souls around the world, all right? 140, you can remain seated as we sing. sing. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. 
take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. And go with me, with me, all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Amen. Brother Sam. All right. It's good to see each and every one of you here tonight. This thing kept falling off here. I'm gonna put it. Yeah, turn it off for just a second. Turn it back on. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll get it right. Glad to see you here tonight. Uh, here on midweek service here, and we got finally got us a little bit of rain, didn't we? The, 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 the ground just. Y'all didn't get your rain out that way. You ain't living right. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we got some rain here, that's for sure. Did we get some rain back at the house? We did get rain? Good. <laughs> well, good, I'm glad. Okay, <laughs> all right, well, good. Well, we're glad you're here this evening, and now we've got, uh, we've got. Uh, I guess the rest of the week's going to be real, real busy. Of course, uh, tomorrow night, we'll be having our Bible Institute from 6 until 9, and then uh, Friday, we will have uh, uh, two nursing home services. Uh, now normally, we don't, uh, uh, at least, uh, we don't normally speak at it. Uh, Chip Bond usually speaks, but uh, uh, Dave and Dora take care of the music out there at Cumberland Ridge on Friday, every Friday morning, but we'll be taking uh, the service out there this Friday, and then our normal service over there at, at uh, Windridge Friday afternoon, and then Friday night we'll be having our uh, uh, missions conference here, and it starts at seven o'clock. And I, you really don't want to miss. You don't want to miss not one service. I'm, I'm not kidding. We've got some great missionaries. We've got some brand new missionaries that are coming. They've not been to the field yet, uh, but we've got some veteran missionaries. Um, we've got Brother Dan Arce, our missionary to Venezuela. He's got some stories that, that uh, I know that you'll not want to miss him t uh, tell you about some of his experiences there in Venezuela. And then we have uh, going to have a missionary that uh, uh, is missionary to uh, Turkey. And he's been, he was in Turkey for 16 years without coming home. And uh, so... Um, He's back here in the States right now, and so uh, he's going to be here with us uh, that uh, uh, this weekend. And we've got one from going to the Philippines and uh, also to the U.K., and you're not going to want to miss. You're just not going to want to miss uh, any of the services. And on Friday, we're kicking it off at 7, and then Saturday night we'll have our 
International Dinner, and that starts at 6 o'clock, uh, 6 o'clock, and uh, we'd like for you, if you can, to bring a dessert or a drink. If, you'd, if you're going to be bringing something else besides some kind of a uh, main dish or something, if you would please see the pastor and, and, uh, uh, and uh, tell him what you'd like to bring, and we can go from there, okay? But we're going to have a great time this coming uh, Friday night and then Saturday night and then Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, we'll be having uh, different missionaries throughout the Sunday school. Uh, some will be teaching here in the uh, adult class and throughout the rest of the Sunday school. And then we'll be having one preaching here Sunday morning. We'll have a great time all day Sunday. You do not want to miss if you possibly can. Okay? All right. Ushers, come at this time. Brother Brian Brandenburg, won't you come on up here and... Lead us in a word of prayer as the ushers come, as we take up the offering. Brother Brian. Let us pray. Lord, Father, we do love you, dear God, and we are so grateful for you, Lord. And Lord, Father, we come to you today, Lord, on 18 years ago this day, Lord, our nation was rocked with uh, terrorist actions, Lord, that cost the lives of thousands, Lord. We just ask you to just continue to be with those families, Lord, as they just find peace with that, Lord. And Lord, Father, though, most importantly, we just ask that they find peace in you, Lord. They just trust you, Lord. And Lord, Father, we just know that everything we do is only through your grace, Lord, and your ability that we can get deeds done, Lord. We just ask that you just uh, take, take the offering that we're about to have, Lord, and use it to uphold thy kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. God bless you. Appreciate you being here tonight. Glad to have you with us on this uh, Wednesday evening. And I'm going to give you some updates and quite a few things here uh, on our prayer list. And then Brother Ryan's going to come and uh, lead us in a time of prayer. And so let me just give you some updates. And as always, we just want to pray that God would just be with us as a church and, and uh, just give us the moving of the Holy Spirit in our midst to be able to see people saved and disciple, to see the work of Christ go forward. And more than anything else, we need God to move in our midst. And so let's pray to that end. Pray that God will be with us and he'll just use us. Remember our different ministries, quite a few things going on. And uh, the Lighthouse Kids Club are going on in the back tonight and our teenagers back there. And, of course, uh, the Sunday school programs and our visitations. But I want you to remember our missionaries. This is our mission week. We, we do have uh, quite a few missionaries. We've got 65 missionaries we support on a monthly basis. We also have a number of young people out of our church that are going uh, around the world, actually, uh, in different places ministering, serving the Lord. And uh, I told Elizabeth today, uh, in the last uh, two weeks, I've had three of those couples call me, and we've had extended conversations uh, just about, well, just about the God's will and, and some things in their lives. And, and I'm not at liberty to say anything about any three. I probably said more right then than I should have, uh, because now y'all be trying to figure out who it was. But anyhow, uh, I want you to pray for our young people and pray for our missionaries. You just pray God be with them and help them and uh, just uh, move in their lives and and uh, just give them some guidance and direction. And I uh, just wanted to be in prayer, if you will. We sure would appreciate it. And uh, just ask God to be with them and help them. And let me give you some updates now. We've got quite a few folk. Uh, we had a, a going on some things happening already this week. Do pray for Sharon Van Etten that, uh, of course, she's got terminal cancer and they have uh, stopped all treatments. But you pray for Miss Sharon. And her husband, Doug, was operated on. They operated on him yesterday or Monday morning. And uh, then they came back and operated again. That was on. That was uh, the way they were doing it. That was scheduled to do that way is what I'm trying to say. 
And remember Sharon and Doug both and pray for them. I had a long conversation with Doug uh, Sunday afternoon, very good conversation. I want you to pray with them or pray for them. Remember them in prayer. Uh, continue to pray for Brother Raymond Webb. He's unable to get up and get out much. And so you pray for Brother Raymond physically. And Brother Robert Rainey uh, still having some issues with his kidneys there. And uh, we do thank you for praying for little Waylon. He is doing real, real well. But uh, we ask you just to keep praying for him. Uh, Miss Dorm again has had some surgery. And she's had several of these replacements. This one's really giving her a hard time. I want you to pray for her that she would heal with that. Uh, remember Brother Ken Lindsay. Brother Ken uh, uh, is in the midst of taking some more treatments now where they took the cancer out. There is a, a pocket of fluid. They're not sure what it is exactly or why it's there. And they're giving quite a few, uh, some chemo and radiation and stuff on it. And so I want you to pray for Brother Ken. You remember his family, Melissa and Maddie, and you pray for him, please. Brother Phil McCullough is uh, in the intensive care unit now in uh, Cookville Hospital. And they had to go in and do some surgery today. He's got some uh, blood clots uh, that has developed from the, where they replaced the hip. Of course, uh, the hip broke because of cancer in the bone. They was not able to get all of the cancer out of the, the leg as they replaced that. He does have cancer in his lungs and also, uh, well, just got in several places. And, and of course, he has a pretty good aneurysm as well. And Brother Phil's real weak, and I want y'all to pray for Brother Phil and Miss Miss Rose, and they spent quite a bit of time with him. I want you to pray for him. God will just give him some peace, and uh, they'll just help him to uh, yield to the Lord here. That's a hard thing to do, but you pray for him if you will. Just remember them, the family, in prayer, and we would appreciate that. Uh, continue to pray if you will for my mom. Lord, just touch her body and lift her up. Miss Jackie Richards, and uh, same thing, just lift him up. Miss Judy Bookman, she's had some surgery and trying to recuperate, and pray for that, please. Remember that. Brother Daniel Sardar, continue to pray for Brother Saint Daniel. He has uh, a toe that actually has a type of gangrene in it, and you pray for him and the doctors. You remember him in prayer, so trying to decide exactly what they need to do there. Uh, Lizzie Elmore did get to come home from the hospital. Uh, she had a little bit of a complication after the uh, delivering the baby, and uh, but she is home now, so do pray for her and, and uh, little Braxton. Remember that in prayer. Also, uh, uh, continue to pray uh, for Nicole and, and uh, uh, of course, Lord Trooper. They're at home. Both of them done well, but continue to pray for them. Uh, continue to pray for Miss Kathy Morgan. She had the knee took out. They have a block in there. And she told me this afternoon it will be sometime in November before they put the knee back in. And so do pray for her as well. Lord, help her. It's going to be a little bit of an ordeal there. And so pray for her, please, if you will, and remember that. Uh, do pray for, for my brother, for Trevor. He has uh, got some kidney stones. They're going to go in Monday, and it's got uh, four of those, and they're going to uh, try to uh, bust all of those on Monday, so do pray for that. We would appreciate that. Miss Kay Selby <coughs> was in the hospital with a stroke on Sun on uh, went in Saturday night, but she got to go home, and she is at home now, doing actually exceptionally well, and so just continue to pray for Miss Kay, that the Lord will just be with her. Remember uh, Brother Don Galuzzi, if you will, he's uh, recuperating from a shoulder replacement, and y'all pray for him. The Lord just help him to heal there as well. And remember that in prayer. Uh, do have some folks in the hospital right now. Do pray for, uh, besides Brother Phil, do pray for uh, Liam Wood. And uh, remember that his parents, Chase and Abby, he's a spina bifida baby. Got a lot of, had several surgeries and several more to come. So do pray for them. Brother Tim Burgess, you got a little uh, a call about that today. Brother Tim's in surgery. Uh, he should be out by now, but they, they took him in surgery just uh, uh, about an hour ago on his left hand. He developed, uh, he cut it at work on Friday and developed a serious infection, and they sent him down to St. Thomas today. He's been in there all day, and they just opened it up a while ago uh, going in to try to, um, to uh, take care of the infection. And uh, so you pray for the Tim that's caring. Uh, they told him he'll be in the hospital at least till Friday there. St. Thomas, so do pray for him. Janice McDaniel, many of y'all may remember Janice and her family, and they've been uh, here for, for a while, but Janice had heart surgery today, and uh, they worked on a couple of vi valves in her heart. She is uh, okay now, or out of the surgery, I mean. Everything went well. And uh, then Mary Lou Woods, and that's Karen Burgess's mother, is back in the hospital with blood clots. They put her back in today, and so do remember that. We sure would appreciate it. And then Brother C.W., as you notice, he's got a sling on. They did surgery on his arm. Everything went well. He's doing well. And uh, so we thank the Lord for that. All right. And so do remember these things. A lot of folk there uh, with a lot of different things going on. 
seems like uh, uh, all of a sudden it just really starts piling up. And so you pray for these folks if you would. Remember that. Pray for Faye Evans. That's my brother Jared's grandmother. She had a hip surgery today as well. And so do remember that. Pray for Wilma Crabtree. She has uh, breast cancer and is starting treatments on that uh, now. Remember that. And pray for a young man. It's been uh, one of our teenagers, Jarrett Halls. If you will pray for him, he's got some uh, uh, problems. It says a possible uh, celiac or Crohn's one. And so do pray for Jarrett, if you will. Remember him in prayer. Uh, pray for uh, Wanda uh, Pfeiffer, if you will. Uh, she's got a, a, a got a clogged arteries and uh, carotid arteries in her neck, and they're going to operate on that Friday. So do pray for her, if you will. And uh, just uh, remember that and pray the Lord just be with her and, and, and pray for that. And do remember today is uh, the 18th anniversary of uh, 9-11. And just pray for our country. Pray for these folks and their families. Do remember that in prayer. And so we make the unspoken request, if you will, by the upraised hand. And as many of you can and will, let's gather around the altar. And uh, Brother uh, Ryan's going to come now. I'm glad to have him here. Him and his wife are traveling on deputation, and he's back for a day and a little couple of days, and he'll be gone again. But uh, he's going to lead us in prayer tonight. love you, Lord, and thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior, and the eternal life we have because of Christ. That fact that he died for us on a cross and shed his blood to pay for our sin. He did for us what we could not do there, was buried and rose again so that we could have that eternal life. And Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And God, Lord, we need you. Lord, as we have met together here on this Wednesday night with your people in your house, Lord, we see from the needs that are mentioned, the requests that have been made, that, Lord, we need you. We cannot live life without you. And Lord, our country needs you as we remember today those that have fallen in the line of duty and those that were fallen because of the terrorist act of others. Lord, we just pray again for our country uh, that through today, through the remembrance of these things, that people would look to you for guidance and for direction. Lord, that people be saved and as they think about their eternity, they would think about Jesus Christ and their need of salvation and they'd be born again. Lord, I pray for our president, our vice president. I pray your hedge of protection about them. Lord, I ask you grant them wisdom. I pray they would seek your word and your will. I pray your hedge about their families. And Lord, we pray for them physically and spiritually. And Lord, we do uh, plead your power in their lives. And Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. And Lord, we thank you, God, that you do hear and you answer prayer. And Lord, as we've come together tonight to pray for one another as a church family, God, we do pray for the classes that are going on in the back, and Lord, we pray for the ministries uh, involved with this church, Lord, the uh, Sunday school classes this Sunday, morning worship services and classes in the junior church program, and those teaching and working in these things. Lord, we ask your blessing on them. We ask your hedge about them. And Lord, we ask your leading in these things. Lord, we pray you be glorified. God, we pray for the Sunday night classes. We pray for the Wednesday night classes that you just work through these things, the young people. Lord, we continue to be saved and reached through these ministries. Lord, we pray you bless every teacher, every helper, every class. God, we pray for Brother Jared and Miss Ashley as they work with the team ministry. We ask your blessings on that. So they can reach teenagers with the gospel of Christ and for the cause of Christ. And they can see lives touched and changed and families change through the team ministry and we'll praise you and thank you for it Lord we thank you for what you've done through all of these classes through Sunday school and Wednesday night and team ministry Lord we praise you and thank you for your blessing your working and Lord we pray for the van ministries and those that drive and help on those ministries and visits we uh, pray your blessings on them we pray your safety on them as they travel uh, each service to bring people to church and take them home we ask your safety over them. We ask your uh, spiritual safety over them. We ask your watch care over the vehicles as they go. And Lord, we praise you for the work you've done in these ministries and those that spend their time to serve you in this work. 
Lord, we pray for our deacons, their wives. We ask you to give them wisdom and guidance in their lives. We ask you to hedge about them physically and spiritually as well. And God, we pray for Brother Ted as he works with the nursing home ministries and uh, the institute classes and the work that he does with the, the print shop and the others that work in the print shop. God, we just thank you for all that you've done through these things, and we pray you continue to bless, continue to bless Brother Ted, and please grant him good health and strength. And watch over him, and we thank you for our pastor and his wife, and we ask you would bless them and keep your heads about them physically and spiritually as well. Keep them from the snares of the devil. Keep them uplifted and encouraged and blessed. And Lord, we just thank you for them. We pray for their family, their children and grandchildren. We ask you watch over them and, and bless them and keep them safe each day. Lord, we pray for uh, Waylon. We pray you continue to grant health and strength to Waylon. Thank you for uh, that which you've already granted to him in prayers that you've answered. And God, we pray for the other requests that are mentioned tonight. There are several in the hospital and in recovering. We pray for little Liam Wood and for Chase and Abby Wood. We ask you to give them grace as they deal with this problem with Liam. We pray and ask for healing for Liam. And Lord, that your, your blessing on this family and on this child. We pray for Brother Tim Burgess as uh, he's just finishing surgery now in Nashville. Lord, we ask for healing for him of the infection. We ask you that you would uh, just give him and Miss Karen and their family grace at this time. I ask your presence be with them. Lord, how we each need your presence in our lives. Lord, we pray for Miss Janice McDaniel. Uh, thank you for bringing her through the surgery. We pray she would recover well. And we ask your help in her life. Uh, physically and spiritually in these things. We pray for Mary Lou Woods and her needs, and we ask your help with her physically tonight. We pray you bless her and, and uh, provide for her health. Lord, we pray for uh, Brother Phil McCullough, Lord, and the uh, cancer that he has, Lord, in his legs and then in his lungs. Lord, we ask your best for him. We commit his needs to you. Lord, we love to see you heal him, and, and Lord, we ask for that. If you'd be pleased to do that, then be your will. Lord, we pray for Miss Rose that you give her special grace as well. We pray for Doug Van Etten and Miss Sharon Van Etten. We pray for both of them and their health needs. And we pray for Doug that you do a work in his heart and life. And Lord, we pray for Miss Sharon and the needs that she has. And Lord, we just commit her needs to you. And Lord, we know that you are able to heal. And so, Lord, we ask for her needs as well. And we ask your best for her. And if it be your will that you might, you might grant healing to her as well and, and heal her. We pray for Brother Ken Lindsay. We thank you for how you have helped him. And we pray for his needs tonight. We ask uh, your best for him. We ask for healing for him as well uh, from this other surgery that he's had and from the cancer that he has had. We pray for Raymond Webb. We ask you would just strengthen Brother Raymond and, and help him. We ask your grace and presence be with him. Lord, we pray for Robert Rainey, and we pray for healing for him of the problem that he has with his kidneys, and we ask that you would grant healing and strength to him. Lord, we pray for Dora McGinn. Thank you for how you have brought her through her surgery. And Lord, we just pray you grant her uh, complete strength and health in that leg. Again, Lord, we pray for Miss Ann Curley. We pray that you would give her uh, strength. We pray you give her health. Lord, I know she has a lot of pain with her legs and her feet. We ask for healing for that of her and the other issues that she deals with. Pray for Miss Jackie Richards. We ask for healing for her, the, the problem with her ankle and uh, the recovery that she is still uh, trying to gain from the surgery she had. And we ask you to just lift her up. And Lord, we pray for Miss Judy Buckman and we ask you to help Miss Judy tonight. Please restore strength to her from her surgery. Lord, please bless her and Brother Buckman. We pray for Brother Daniel Sadar. And Lord, we pray for him and this infection in his foot. And God, Lord, we know you can heal that. And we pray for the uh, circulation problems. And Lord, we pray you give the doctors wisdom to help him with both of these needs. But Lord, we ask for your healing and your touch in his life. Lord, we pray for Lizzie Elmore. We thank you that the baby is well. We pray that Lizzie... Uh, would be well and recover well. We ask you to watch over her and Brother John. Give them your grace tonight as well. We pray for Kathy Morgan. We ask you to help her as she recovers uh, from surgery also. We just commit her needs to you. We ask your strengthening in her life and your grace. We pray for Brother Trevor. Uh, Curly, Lord, we ask you to help Brother Trevor with his kidney stones. And Lord, please 
grant healing, grant relief to him, give the doctors wisdom and skill to uh, help him with this, and we'll praise you for this as well. I pray for Miss Kay Selby, and Lord, thank you that she's doing better, recovering uh, from her stroke, and Lord, we just praise you for that, we ask you to grant her continued health and strength and recovery in these things. Lord, we pray for Brother Clarence White, and Lord, thank you that his surgery went well. We pray for recovery for him and strengthening of him uh, since his surgery. We thank you that he's able to be here tonight. I pray for my grandma, Della Rivers. I pray for my uncle, Jim Rivers, both of them having physical problems and health needs. We commit their needs to you. We ask your best for them. And Lord, if you'd be pleased to grant them healing, we ask you for that. And we praise you and thank you for this also. Lord, we pray for Faye Evans that had a surgery today on her hip. We just ask that she would recover well, and that would go well, and that you re restore strength to her. We pray for Wilma Crabtree that has uh, started uh, treatment for breast cancer. God, we ask for her in a special way. We ask you grant healing to her, help the treatment to go well. And Lord, just give uh, Brother Eric Burgess grace in this. Give Lord, we'll watch over him and, and Jerry and, and help them tonight as well with their needs, please. Lord, we pray for Jarrett Hawes and we pray for uh, the celiac or Crohn's disease that uh, he is dealing with. We ask your help there. And Lord, we uh, pray for Jarrett. Lord, we ask for healing for him. Give the doctors wisdom to help him. But Lord, uh, we commit his need to you and we ask you we grant healing to him. Please help that young man, and, and do help Miss Erica and uh, her mom as well that we've prayed for here. We pray for uh, Wanda Pfeiffer, and we ask for her in the, the operation this Friday for the artery in her neck. And uh, Lord, we pray for Miss Wanda. We pray that surgery go well. And Lord, we pray that she not have complication from it. And we ask you to restore her health to her, please. And Lord, we pray also, again, for our nation, our leaders, uh, Lord, that you just grant wisdom. God, we pray for those in our Senate, our House of Representatives, our Supreme Court justices, our state uh, legislators. Lord, each one that are lost, we ask and pray that you would send soul winners their way. Lord, help them to see clearly and plainly the truth of the gospel and be saved and then follow you in their decisions and in their work that you've given them to do. God, thank you for our country and the freedom we have. Thank you for our soldiers and those that fight for our freedom and help preserve that. And we praise you and thank you for them. We ask your watch care over them and safety as many of them are overseas serving. And Lord, we pray that you would just bless our military chaplains, those reaching uh, our military men and women with the gospel of Christ. We ask you to bless them and their families and keep your heads about them. And Lord, we pray for the missions conference coming up on Friday through Sunday, we ask your blessing on it. Please speak to our hearts about the need for the lost here in Crossville and Cumberland County and in Tennessee and around the world. Help us to have a burden and a renewed desire to win the lost and help us to see people more like you do and to love them more like you do. Give us that heart, Lord, and we'll thank you for it. Lord, we love you. I pray for the unspoken needs and the many hands went up tonight. We ask you to hear and answer prayer as only you can. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the prayers you've answered time and time again. Lord, we commit these things to you. We ask it all in Christ's name and for your glory, God. Amen. Well, amen. God bless you. It's always good to be able to come and have a time of prayer. If you have your Bible now, I want you to open with me, if we will, to the book of Proverbs, the 29th Proverb. Proverbs 29, we've been going through the book of Proverbs for quite some time now. Uh, tried to get a proverb a night, but the 29th Proverb is my favorite proverb. I said that last week. We only got seven verses. I'm going to start in verse 1, at least read verse 1 again, and then drop down to verse 8. And I'm reading verse 1 for a reason. And uh, then we'll, we'll see how far we get tonight. Verse number one. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, that without remedy. I think verse one of Proverbs 29 is one of these verses that really uh, sets the stage for everything else that's coming under it. 
And there's a warning that God gives. God says, if you being often reproved, and by the way, I think God reproves all of us. He does that with the Word of God. He does that with, with the Holy Spirit of God. If you're saved tonight for sure, and that is his job. He reproves the world, and he works in our lives. He does it with the folks that God's put around us. And he says, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck. In other words, you're often reproved and just ignore the reproof. God speaks to our hearts. God speaks to us about what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, the things we need to change or not change. God speaks to us and you harden your neck. Well, then the warning is, shall suddenly be destroyed that without remedy. And God says, there'll come a time that I'll deal with it, and I'll deal with you in a way that there'll be no remedy. And so as we go through this 29th proverb, I'll refer back and forth to that, to that verse and to that principle. And God's going to give a warning. And God's going to give some reproof. And as he gives some reproof, along with that reproof comes this, that God says, now listen to me. If you harden your neck against me, there will come a time that I'll deal with you in a way that there's no remedy. So we start verse number 8. I actually think verse eight, eight, verses 8 through 12 uh, produce a contrast between someone that is scornful of the law and of the reproof and someone that is wise to listen to the word of God and to the reproof. There's a contrast between those two as we go down. So we pick up at verse number 8, and it says, Scornful men bring a city into a snare, but wise men turn away wrath. I want you to notice he begins to, we, we, throughout the Proverbs, we've, uh, he's made reference to scornful and scorners. And really, if you, you say, what in the world does that mean, really? I mean, what, what, what are, you, are you talking about when you're saying scornful? It's someone that, that is haughty, prideful, high-minded, especially concerning things of morality and right and wrong. They make a mock at it. It's uh, something that they're, uh, they're, they're just uh, uh, scoff at. And you'll find that scornful people always do something. They always bring a city or those that listen to them, into a snare. You know, I've lived long enough now in this great nation of ours, and we still have the greatest nation on the face of God's green earth in my mind. And I've been around a little bit and been in some other countries, and I still thank God for our country. But we've got some problems in our country with some scornful people. We've got a lot of folks who don't believe this Bible is the word of God, and they mock it and make fun of it. We've got some of those people are in positions of power. Some of those people in positions of influence, and in some places in our nation, more than others, they have influenced uh, whole cities to turn away from the things that are right. And I've lived long enough now to have seen some of that turning, and, and now I've lived long enough to see the snare that it's brought it in, destroyed it, brings it into something. And God says, you the, the word of God that God has given us and the things that God says is right and wrong in the Bible and how to live and how not to live and the morality. It's not just that God is up in heaven saying, now these are my laws and, and I just give these to you to see how hard I can make, make it on you. That's not what God's doing. I try to tell folks all the time, especially new converts, when God gives things in the scripture, it is through his wisdom that God says to me, uh, just take the Ten Commandments. That's the wisdom of God. It's not, it is the authority of God, I understand that. It is that God is the almighty, omnipotent, omniscient God, and he could give those commandments just because he said so if he wanted to. We have a wise, loving God, and when he put the Ten Commandments there, and by the way, I still think there are commandments there, he gives the Ten Commandments, it is for my protection. It, it is not so that God can, can, can make a, a, just a rule over me. It's so God says, now look, Mike, this stuff's not good for you. You do what I tell you to do, and you, you obey me, and you're going to find that, that life's going to be a lot easier. Now, you go against that. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What serve a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And God said, you go against that, and I'll just take my hands off and see how you like it when you get there, when we get where you're going. And that's what this verse is making reference to. He says, you listen to these scornful people that are 
these that, that are against the things of God, these folks that want to take the Bible out of our society, want to take the mention of Christ out of our society, want to take the just any reference to the things that are right and wrong according to the Scripture, you follow that, and it'll bring a snare to any city, any group that actually follows that. And so that's the warning. That, that is the warning in verse number 8. But then there's the contrast. And there's always the contrast. And you'll notice and it says, Scornful men bring a city into a snare, but, the, but wise men turn away wrath. Now that's interesting. He says, now you, you listen to that scornful, and it's going to bring it into a snare. But now who's the wise here? you you got to go back all, all the way back to Proverbs 1, where it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Any time that the book of Proverbs is talking about someone being wise, it's not talking about a IQ level that we might attach to it in our society. It's not talking about an education level. It's what it's talking about is the fear of the Lord. And he says, now, what they do is going to turn away wrath. Whose wrath? Not the wrath of man. The wrath of God. The truth of the matter is what God is expecting you and I to do as Christians is to be giving a lost and dying world, even the scornful, is tell them about Jesus Christ. The only hope they have is Christ. The only hope of wrath being turned away from, from a city or, or from a family or for an individual is to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and let him give them real peace. There is no real peace outside of that. There is no real peace outside following the word of God so there's the contrast. By the way, you go back to verse number one. There will come a time, those that are being often reproved and following the scornful, that God will just pull his hand back and say, now there's no remedy for what's going to happen to you. It's great truth in that. Now watch another contrast in verse number nine. And you'll, you'll see a, a, a contrast, and it says, If a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. Now, uh, here you, you have a contrast between a wise man. Remember what that is now. That's someone that believes the Bible and follows the word of God, has a fear of God. And a foolish man, and what do we see about that? The foolish says in his heart, there is no God. Someone that lives and acts as if there is no God, or at least as if God has no control over their lives, or God has no, no ability to move in their midst one way or the other. And he says, now, if a wise man contends with a foolish, and by the way, they, they, you, you and I do need to contend for the truth. Uh, the, the Bible still says in the book of James, uh, the book of Jude, excuse me, that we ought to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. It is important that we're contending for that in more ways than one. And so here you know, Solomon gives a little bit of a warning, though, from God. And he says, listen, when you contend with that, Oftentimes, here's what's going to happen. Let's go back and look at the verse. What's going to happen when you contend? If a wise man contended with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. He says, you know what's going to happen to you? It doesn't matter whether he's raging, he's angry as he can be, or whether he's laughing and mocking, scorning, there's still no rest. I have uh, been preaching long enough and been saved long enough trying to reach people that I understand this perfectly. As a matter of fact, if you've been saved trying to reach people and trying to contend with them about their soul, trying to get them to get saved, get right with God, probably somebody comes to your mind. And it doesn't matter what you do, whether they're angry or laughing, there's no rest because they just reject it. They reject what's there. There again, there will come a time, back to verse 1, and God will deal with them in a mighty way. We find verse number 10. The bloodthirsty hate the upright, but the just seek his soul. Now, there's another contrast. You, you, you're going to find that the bloodthirsty hate the upright. He, he's trying to, God is giving us something to help us understand what takes place so you're not surprised by it. Uh, sometimes people are very surprised whenever that the, the, the bloodthirsty and the wicked crowd attack that which is right. And I think one of the, the, one of the things that, uh, one of the issues that is interesting is the Word of God. It, it is amazing how that a, a Bible verse can be 
quoted somewhere. Someone can be in some sort of, uh, especially some sort of a public meeting, and they'll quote the Bible or they'll pray in Jesus' name, and people get so angry about it. And sometimes it discourages a lot of people. It, it shouldn't discourage you. God said they hate it. And Jesus said if they hated him, they'd hate those that follow him. Every once in a while I, I deal with people and they say, well, Jesus, everybody loved Jesus. Why did they crucify him? Because they loved him. Because they hated him. There's great truth in that. Now, Jesus loves everyone, wants everyone to be saved. There's no doubt about that. He is the God of love. But I guarantee you that there is a crowd, there always has been and always will be, that hates the truth. Just because you give the truth. Have you ever, as it became clear to me years ago, even as a teenager, and a youth director carried me to challenge us to carry our Bibles to school. It was amazing how that you challenge somebody to carry a Bible to school and the bloodthirsty get angry about it. It's the great truth. I seen something along that line this week. Uh, not necessarily for or against anything, but Drew Brees, he's quarterback for the, New Orleans Saints. And somewhere along the line, the last three or four weeks, he challenged Christian teenagers to carry their Bibles to school. Now, why he did it, or what I don't know anything about Drew Brees, that's just not a bad idea all the way around. My youth director challenged me that way years ago, and it's a good challenge. But you ought to have seen the backlash he got out of it. Now, if he had a challenged them to carry the Koran, they'd have been all right with that. If they had challenged them to carry some book that had full of pornography or foul language, they'd have been okay with that. Why Why did they get so upset over him challenging teenagers to carry a Bible to school? Why did they get so upset over that? Because the bloodthirsty hate the righteous. That shouldn't surprise you. His reaction, it sort of surprised him. It shouldn't have surprised him. He should have just double down, stayed where he was at. Great truth. You see, the truth of the matter is that verse, God's trying to explain something to you and I. He's trying to explain that, that you're going to find you stand for the, for the truth. And there's going to be a certain amount of folk that hate you just because you stand for the truth. And you will never satisfy them. You will never have them as your friends, no matter what you do, unless you deny the Lord Jesus Christ and you deny the truth. It's great truth. Now, verse number 11, I've got that verse underlined. This is one of these verses I'm constantly trying to help folk with. It's one of these verses I, uh, you, you could preach a lot of sermons out of. And I want you to notice what it says. Here's a contrast. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. There's a great truth in verse number 11. Years ago, God get, used that verse to help me. I do not have to say everything I know. I certainly don't need to say everything I think. As a matter of fact, it's pretty foolish just to spout out everything. And I guess the older I get, the whole lot more cautious I am about what I'm saying. For a lot of reasons. It, it's funny. It, it goes from things that are just sort of doesn't really matter to things that are very important. Let me just throw out what I'm trying to say. And just like here at church, people will call me or come by and say, Preacher, you need to put this on the prayer list. I've learned... Before I spout that, check it out. I learned to check it out. You say, why is that? It needs to be out there quickly because a lot of times, a lot of times somebody will come back later, preacher, I was wrong about that. And I've already spouted it out. Now that's, you say, ah, that really matter. Yes and no. It's sort of like the boy crying wolf. It does matter. It does matter if you're, Constantly saying things and having to back up on it. Well, I jumped the gun on that and didn't know what I was doing on that, and that's not exactly right. Then people, when you say something, they think, I don't know whether this guy's right or not. He just spouts out stuff all the time. So the truth of the matter is, he says, you know what? 
It's a lot better for you to just hold your peace. You don't have to have everything in your mind. Let me take this another way, too. There's always going to be things in your life that you know that does not need to be told. I don't care if it's true or not. That's irrelevant. Just because it's true doesn't mean that it needs to be spoken. It takes discretion from a child of God, from a man or woman of God, to seek God's help and oftentimes just to be quiet about something. Sometimes there are things in every one of our lives that God's going to show us so that we can pray for someone, that we can encourage someone, that we can maybe give them some godly advice. And that thing needs to be kept quiet. Is that true from the Scripture? It would help you, you and I as Christians, greatly if we would just learn in verse number 11 to say, you know something? I just need to be quiet. I just need to not utter my mind. Now go back at the contrast. Once you notice what it says, look, look at the verse again. Look at the total contrast of it. A fool uttereth all his mind. There's that word fool in there. How often have we seen that from the first proverb to this one? It is always indicative of somebody that just doesn't follow God in any way. Anytime that I'm uttering all of my mind and just letting out everything that I know and think, it's foolish. A fool uttereth all his mind. Now watch the contrast. But a wise man keepeth it in, now watch the phrase, the end of the phrase, till afterwards. You say, what, what, what does till, till afterwards mean? Well, if you start practicing not uttering all you know, you'll find each situation there will come an afterwards in that situation. And that's not a specific time, that's not a couple of days or a couple of weeks or couple of months, it's till afterwards. You say, what's afterwards? Each situation is different. I can assure you of that. So God is saying, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to recognize that all the information you have is something you need to hold in till afterwards. Till afterwards. The same thing is true not only with speaking things before you check them out and things about people that you really don't need to say, but it's also true of the things you think. Years ago, it, as a, a, a young person, I thank God for my dad and mom. My dad and mom raised me and my little brother uh, to, first of all, to obey our parents and to obey authority and do the right thing. We were also raised that uh, we have uh, elders and people over us, and yes, we're to think and understand and think things out, but Keep your mouth shut on a lot of things. And the older I get sometimes, and I deal with certain issues, I find myself coming to an altar and getting on an altar and say, Lord, thank you, and there's always a certain mind, time in my mind, a certain instance where someone said something or someone did something and I thought something that is totally wrong. And I'm saying, Lord, thank you that I kept my mouth shut. Is that true for me? Is that true for me? The older I get, it makes me want to be quiet. Oftentimes people are saying, don't you know anything about that? And I say, yep. Why are you saying something? Yep. Yep. Is that true? You don't have to utter everything you know. You really shouldn't utter everything you know. And you shouldn't utter everything you think. Until afterwards. Till after what? Till after you've learned the will of God and what God's doing. Until it's going to be a help to people, not a hindrance. Till it's going to be an encouragement to people, not a discouragement. Fool utter through all the he knoweth. One of the ways I know that if I'm uttering something that's foolish is how does it help people? How does it affect people? If I'm uttering something about someone, does it encourage them or tear them down? Does it encourage them in your eyes or tear them down? It's probably not wise if it tears them down. 
What I'm uttering, does it help the cause of Christ or hurt the cause of Christ? Does it hurt the unity of the body of Christ or does it separate the unity? There's some great truth in that verse. I told you I get hung on that verse. I could, I could speak several hours on that verse. Because there's a principle here that the greatest thing I can learn to do is probably be quiet most of the time, especially when I'm talking about a lot of other things, and especially what I think until, I, until afterwards, until I know the will of God and what God would have me to do. Great truth in that verse. I like the contrast. I told you I'd take all these back to verse number one. You take that back to verse number one, you find the contrast in it. Either being often reproved or in his neck. It seems like some people never learn to be quiet. They just got to talk all the time. They just got to say whatever they know. There will come a time that God says, I'm through with that. And there will be something happen without remedy. You say, why? Because I would not quit talking. Great truth in that. Even, even as I said that, there's a couple of things that come to mind where I told somebody, if you do not learn to be quiet, you're going to destroy this relationship. Sometimes with husbands and wives, sometimes with family, sometimes with friends, sometimes where they work. And I would say to them, if you do not learn to be quiet, you're going to destroy something. And even as I'm saying this, I've got some names going through my mind that come by and say, Preacher, I've messed it up. What do I do now? It's destroyed without remedy. Destroyed without remedy. The truth of the matter is, I either learn to be quiet until afterwards, which is different with each situation, or there will come a time that my talking all the time will destroy something without remedy. Great truth. Great truth. Next verse, verse number 12. I think verse number 12, these verses are a contrast. All of them are. You find, if a ruler hearken to lies, all his servants are wicked. There's the truth in that. He said, if a ruler listens to lies and all the people around him, they're wicked. And I realize this here is making reference to, and we've said this several times throughout the book of Proverbs, it, it makes reference to kings and princes and rulers. And things are a little different in our nation. Thank the Lord they are. We've got a different form of government. But they're still rulers. And I can even take that down just a little further. I've, I've pastored long enough and dealt with families long enough. Uh, my goodness, I can take that to mom and dads. If you hearken to lies, you're going to find a hard thing to your children. It's, in, it's important that whenever you're in a position anywhere, you don't hearken to lies. You don't listen to, to, to those things. Have enough discernment to know what is right and wrong and for, for God to help you and to take a stand on the truth because if you don't, everybody around you will be wicked because two things happen when you hearken to lies. When you hearken to lies, those kind of people flock to you, and people that hate lying leave you. And that's what that contrast is. You hearken to lies, you'll attract to that like flies to honey. You are against lies, and they'll leave you. And there is a great contrast there, a great contrast. And you and I... And throughout life, you're going to have to make up your mind. You're going to hearken to those things or not, and certainly it's true in rulers. They ought to be very steadfast. Anybody that's in a position of leadership ought to be very steadfast. They're looking for truth, and truth alone, not lies. What a great truth. I find then in verse number 13 and 14, we go back to lifting up the poor. We, we ended last week on verse 7 with that, and I may come back to verse 7 and bring that truth into that again. Uh, but let's read verse 13 and 14 to start with. The poor and the deceitful, the poor and the deceitful man meet together. The Lord lighteneth both their eyes. The king that faithfully judgeth the poor, his throne shall be established forever. Now I want you to notice that, that, that he, he says something, a little bit of a contrast there in verse number 13 when he says, the poor and the deceitful man meet together. 
hold on, they meet together, what happens? The Lord lightens both their eyes. What do you mean by that? Well, obviously, with the deceitful, I'll start with that. It is just like the contrast here that he had been often reproved. God said, you're deceitful, you're wrong. I'm going to reprove your heart. I'll lighten your eyes. I'll give you light. I'll give you truth. Now, what you do with that is going to determine what God does with you. The poor meet together. God lightens his eyes. What does he lighten his eyes about? Well, in verse 14, he lightens his eyes about something. He lightens the king's eyes about it. And you notice it says, The king that faithfully judgeth the poor, his throne shall be established forever. He says, you know, God's put you in a position to faithfully judge the poor, to help them. And God will establish his throne. Well, what was that? We'll go back to verse number 7. And we ended on that last week, and I'm going to tie those together again. And you, you notice it says, The righteous contendeth, can, excuse me, The righteous considereth the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to know it. Remember last week we, we looked at that verse and, and, and there's a couple of things we said about it and we're going to tie that with what we've just seen. You see, it says the righteous considereth the cause of the poor. It's interesting what God says there. He uses the word consider. By the way, it doesn't say the righteous sees the cause of the poor or the poor. It's one thing to see it. It's one thing to... To, to look out and see the, 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 the poor and just see it, to have empathy or compassion or sorrow. It's one thing to see it. It is entirely another to consider it. You see, when you consider something, you think about it. When you consider something, you look at it. When you consider something, you're trying to see what's going on here. You're looking at it. You're, you're, you're saying, what's, what's the cause and effect here? You know what, the, what, what God expects out of you and I as the righteous? He expects us to consider the cause of the poor, by the way, both physically and spiritually. What makes them where they're at? I used a little example last week that I had that week, and I, I use it all the time. People, When I'm dealing with people, I ask them, I say, is God able to take care of you? Is God able to take care of someone physically? Sure he is. Is God able to take care of you spiritually and emotionally? Sure he is. Well, then if there's a, someone that is poor in that area, then if God's not taking care of them, then I need to ask myself a question, why? If God's not taking care of my needs, and God's not taking care of me, then I need to be very prudent and say, why? It's either God can't or God won't. There's a great truth in that. And so if you're going to faithfully consider the cause of the poor, you've got to ask that question, why? Why is it that the omnipotent, omniscient, almighty God that loves every individual equally and the same and is no respecter of persons, isn't that who God is? And if God is not taking care of someone, why? That is a legitimate question. If God's not taking care of me, why? If God's not meeting my needs, why? Why is that? There's always a spiritual problem. It goes back to what we've seen throughout the Proverbs. It goes back to, to who God is and what God says. For example, if I regard iniquity in mine heart, the Lord will not hear me. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and he will not hear. You see, God is a loving, merciful, compassionate, holy God. And God is able to take care and do all kinds of things above what anything that we think or do, and has and will and does tonight. I'm going to tell you something you cannot make God do. You cannot make God compromise with sin. You cannot make God go against the word of God. That's why people must be born again. There will be no sin in heaven. And the only way that you and I could enter heaven was through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You reject the blood of Christ, you'll be the poorest you'll ever be of anything in the world. You'll die and go to hell. And it's because God will not allow anyone into heaven outside the redemptive power of the blood of Christ. Great truth of that. Now that principle then 
begins to take place in everything else. I cannot live contrary to the word of God and God bless me. I cannot live in contrary to what God says is right and wrong and God bless me because he will not bless sin. I often tell folks trying to help them in dealing with, with people, and dealing with grown children. Luke chapter 16, whenever you look at the prodigal sons, a tremendous truth. We, we look at that, verses 19 through 31 of that, we look at this prodigal son, we look at him, and we, we, we see all that he goes through and everything that happens to him, and we see his action and see what he did, and we see where he went to and how he come back. Now, I want you to notice a couple things with it. First of all, I want you to notice that the father, which is a picture of God, allowed him to walk away. God allowed it. If I decide tonight I'm going to live contrary to this book and contrary to what God wants me to do, God will allow it. It's called free choice. Freedom of choice. But along with freedom of choice comes responsibility. The prodigal son walked away, and he walked away with a lot of wealth. He took that wealth, and he lived contrary to the morality that God would have him to live, and he wasted his substance with riotous living. He made some very poor choices. And after he had made those choices, he then found himself in great want. And then he found out nobody gave to him. Nobody helped him. And then he, he found out that as he's going down that path, he ended up in the hog pen. And for the Jewish folks, that was the lowest of a low place you could ever go was a hog pen. And he was so hungry, he would eat with the hogs. Now, the Bible says in that position he came to himself. He came to himself. I did this to me. It's not my dad's fault. It's not my brother's fault. It's not my friend's fault. It's not society's fault. I made some very poor choices, and I put myself in this position, and he came to himself. And he, goes, he has a repentance, and he goes back. And by the way, the Father receives him and helps him. But I want you to think of something else. Do you know God knew where he was at whenever he was hungry? You know that God knew where he was at whenever he lost it all, and you knew God knew where he was at when he was down in the hog pen, and you knew God could have fed him without eating slop, but God did not. Because God loves him, and what God was after was his soul, which is far more important than the physical things of life, and he knew he would not come to a place of repentance until he first came to himself. So when you're reading these passages and you come to verse number 7 and then you come back down to verse 13 and 14 of this psalm, uh, this proverb, and you're looking at this and it says that the, the, the righteous faithfully considereth the cause of the poor. i got to consider what in the world i got to help them. If I'm going to help them, by the way I do, I say, what in the world are you here for? What got you here? God's able to help you. Why is he not? What in the world's going on here? How, how do we need to change this? You don't have to take responsibility for your life. I'm constantly trying to encourage folks, don't matter who it is, to be self-sufficient, self-supporting, not relying on anybody except the Lord Jesus Christ to meet your needs. Great truth in that. And so I find in these verses, I find in this passage that God says, you know something? The poor and deceitful men meet together and the Lord lighten both their eyes. Well, I hope I get a little bit of understanding how he, how he lightens the eyes of the poor. He says, now listen, this is what you need to do. You need to live right. You need to repent of your sin. Take responsibility for your actions. God still says a man does not work, neither shall he eat. Take responsibility for yourself. Take responsibility for your actions. God lightens your eyes. Make up your mind whether you're going to do it or not. Because God's able you find that in verse 14, it goes back to it. The king that faithfully judges the poor, his throne should be established forever. That faithfully judging the poor isn't just giving it all. It isn't this Robin Hood mentality that you take something away from someone that's made the right decisions, the right choices, 
and God's blessed and giving it to somebody that refuses to do that. That's not what that's talking about. It is faithfully judging it. It is looking at it. Why are we here? What are we going to do to change it? How are we going to put people up? We're going to give them the biblical way. And by the way, once you do that, God will take care of it. I guarantee you that any person that will yield themselves to a mighty God, God will take care of them because he is able. He'll take care of you without anybody helping him because he doesn't need it. And these passages, this 29th proverb is a great proverb. And he that hardens his neck, he that being offering his food, hardens his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy in every facet of our lives. And I see it coming true. The older I get, the more I see it. The older I get, the more I see that all the time God just sits back and says, you know what? You've hardened your neck. You're not doing the right thing. And you're going to find out there is a judgment for that. And there is no remedy. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I appreciate you being here tonight. Well, I was afraid I wouldn't get through this again tonight, but that's all right. We'll pick up next Wednesday night right here again. <laughs> Invitations like this tonight. There may be somebody here tonight and say, Preacher, I've never been saved. If I died right now, I do not know for an absolute fact that I go to heaven. If that's true tonight, you're not sure that you're saved, then why don't you come to the front with one of our personal words, take a Bible, and they'll take the blessed old book, and they'll answer your questions. They'll show you from the Bible how to know you're going to heaven.